So let me uh, first of all start by summary what I was doing and what I would like to remember. So um, from last lecture, so we were doing idea bot theorem. And again, uh, as I told you, this is just integration. I mean, we are using this quite a lot. So it's integration of uh, a currently closed form. So I have a manifold with U1 action. And then uh, I have this formula. So the fixed points uh, pi d over 2 alpha zero at fixed points and then fixed point and then again uh, remember that I mean my supersymmetry was this guy v of x and then uh, the requirement for my form is this. And again, actually what we are doing is, I mean, this is integral of a whole manifold. So you actually integrate the top form, but this is a Lauer's component because to solve this condition, it involves all degrees of the forms. And then what I would like that you remember when we were constructing this guy, right? So we were doing things up to quadratic order, so minus t, h mu nu x mu x nu plus s mu nu psi nu psi nu plus high order terms. And I told you that the answer can be written in two ways. Either it's a square root of determinant of s or a square root of determinant of h. And then if I use my linearized symmetry, right, then I know that h is equal to dv of s and then I get something much better at the level of determinants. So I mean this is important to remember because of infinite dimensional setup. So this is first thing I would like to that you remember. Um, then basically uh, I told you another setup. So I was discussing I mean this thing when we have uh, you know, vector bundle. And so, for example, I was telling you about uh, this model, so integration over this model. Um, so this is in principle the formalism, and there are two forms. So I'm just mentioned, uh, so if you're um, actually want to do things properly, I can explain some of the things during exercise classes. So there are different versions of Matai, Aquilin, etc. I mean, if you want to actually understand geometrically what we are doing in physics, it's good to study. So there is a normal thing about, um, I mean, non equivalent version of uh, Matai, Aquilin class representative. Then there is a equivalent version, version so that's what basically I was writing for you last time. Very sketchy. I can give you more details. And then there is something uh, which is um, uh, basically related to the quotient. So when I have to have a principal bundle times V quotient, etc. So it's the same representation of this. But this is actually um, what we have to do in gauge theory. So there is this another thing. So if you're interested, there is a paper by Atia and Jeffrey, which discussing. I don't have time uh, to do it. So, but um, basically, at some point, I have to introduce for you ghosts and stuff like this. And uh, of course, as a physicist, you know that you need ghosts to do the gauge fixing. But there is a proper mathematical explanation for this, and this has been done at then the end of 80s, etc. So I mean, there are these different levels of the model. I'm just mentioning this in case you want to do it, learn it properly. I simply don't have time to explain. 
So what I was doing last time, we actually replaced whatever problems we write here by some linearized problem. So what I was telling you that I can write for you this linearized problem. Sorry, x. So again, this is even, odd, odd, even. So this is just some operation. Then I would have delta chi equal to h, delta h equal to r1 chi. So if you want, either I construct Birsti exact term so I can equally write in transformations here. I can also add these terms i d x plus i d psi. I mean, it doesn't matter. Either I put these things, because this is actually a field redefinition how you define your h. Either you define your h by itself or you write like this. You can go back and forth. So you write Birsti exact term. So d is another operator. Okay, and then uh, what I did last time for you, so we were calculating determinants. So we write Bersti exact terms, we do whole things, and then what do we get? We get the following, that zeta up to some terms is proportional to determinant 1 over 2, i0, i over 2, d dagger minus i over 2, d r one, and then here we have a determinant of one over two. So here for everything to work, so for this algebra to work, or another thing is that uh, I have to require the following thing, I have to require that R1 D is equal to D R zero. I mean, it depends, for example, this can follow from this requirement. Okay. So if you want um, all the supersymmetry I wrote at linearized level, you can think of also as some diagram. So uh, I have my field, uh, for example, I can write as a bundle E0, I go to E minus 1, so this is field X, this is chi, this is bundle F1, this is my field Psi, F0, this is my field H, so you see this is fermions, this is odd guys, so I have here for example minus ID, then ID, then I have here I0, and then I have R1. If I add simply these arrows from here to zero, I get uh, what people call in mathematics complex. It's basically by complex. Okay. So now we would like to discuss um, how all these operations and what we actually would like to have an infinite dimensional uh, setting and the whole thing we would like to make sense. So this formula, as I told you last time, you could equally collapse to the following formula. So determinant 1 over 2 on the kernel of dd dagger of minus r1, determinant of 1 over 2 on the kernel of d dagger d of minus, I mean, I don't actually need this minus, it's not important, r1. You remember I told you formulas with here, but it was one over fourth here, so I can pull it back and forth. Okay. Hmm? All right, sorry, uh, I zero. So for example, just for future, it's very easy to remember what is going on. If your symmetry goes from bosons to fermions, then it goes downstairs. If it goes from uh, fermions to bosons, this is comes upstairs. So this is always will be the, the thing. Uh, so now uh, all this operation, so in infinite dimensional setting, infinite dimensional setting, all these guys, R0, R1, D, 
are differential operators. So we have to discuss actually what do we uh, need from these operators for the answer to make sense and also discuss different uh, opportunities. I mean, what we can do, etc. Because there are, for example, if you go to back to 30 years and typically operators like R0, R1 used to be zero. So I would like to explain you these things. And um, the main thing what we have to do now, I would like to discuss with you, it's uh, different notions for operators. So I would like to discuss for you. Uh, so let me remind you elliptic operators. Elliptic operators. So elliptic operator, uh, it's a linear operator on my manifold, so I can write as a L of U. So this is some, if I write, so it's a local notion. So I, it's enough to write for me in local coordinates, but of course I can have operator function in differential forms, etc., etc. but I'm not concerned here with a, so in general operator will have some coefficients and then I will have something like this. So by this, of course, I understand uh, this is a multi index. So this is, I don't know, D1 in some power, I don't know, alpha 1, etc. Dn in power alpha n. It's so this is derivative. So I look at my operator, etc. So for every operator, differential operator, I can correspond what's called a symbol. So symbol is the following thing. So the operator, this is what you will call mth order operator here. But I'm looking only at the leading part in derivatives. And what I will do, I will basically replace this guy. So symbol is the following object. It's a symbol of this operator. Let me call it D. Okay, so symbol of this operator. So I'm looking at the top uh, thing in derivatives and then I'm basically, so I'm looking at alpha equal exactly to m. So I will call this operator of order m. And then I will uh, look at alpha x. And then I introduce formal variable xi. So xi is just a vector which depends to rn. So instead of every derivative I have here, I just put xi. Okay? And the thing is that this should be non-degenerate away. So this should be non-degenerate away from origin. So again, for every operator, I can identify the symbol. And if symbol satisfies this property, then operator is called elliptic. So let me give you an example. So example. So your favorite operator, for example, uh, Laplace operator on the scalar function. So if I would have a function, then I can write for the operator i from 1 to n, second derivatives of dxa on u. Okay. So the symbol for these guys is that the symbol for Laplace operator is just sum i from 1 to n xi1 square, xi i square. So it's definitely positive if I f if when all xi is equal to zero. So this is elliptic operator. Now what is important here is that ellipticity, if I add here the terms of null order, I don't care about it if it's, you know, it will not modify ellipticity. Well, um, exercise, you can do it yourself. So if you look again, uh, what you were reading last night in Nakahara, I hope. Uh, so there is the things on, if I have a manifold, right, I have a differential form. So from P form, I can uh, map to P plus one form, I have a DRAM. Then if I put a metric on the manifold, I can introduce uh, D dagger, so which will map in opposite direction. So I will have also D dagger. And then they will be uh, on P forms. I mean, they will be 
correspondently Laplace operator, which is defined d d dagger plus d dagger d. So I'm asking you to prove that this is elliptic operator. Well, in fact, if you read Nakahara, it's it's proven there. Okay. Uh, so the question is, why do we interested in these operators? And another exercise, okay, another exercise, it's important. Uh, so Dirac operator. So proof ellipticity. I mean, there are a lot of details because you have to think in which dimensions you are, etc. Again, I think it's done in Nakahara if you look it up. So, uh, I mean, there are two question, I mean, questions why do we like elliptic operators and they do IP in physics. Um, um, so there is this uh, famous mathematician. So there is, um, so I have an operator. Somehow I'm hesitating to tell you too much math, but I have an operator D on M on manifold. So there is another notion of for the operator, it's called Fredholm operator. Operator. So this is a guy who got a PhD in Uppsala, by the way. Uh, so the operator you call Fredholm if it has a finite dimensional kernel and co-kernel. So if you look at dimensionality, so again, I'm talking of course only about uh, linear operators. So if dimension of kernel D is less than infinity and dimension of co-kernel of D is less than infinity. So co-kernel you can think is just a, a kernel of D dagger. So for example, by the way, these operators are self-adjoint, so D, okay? So if they are finite dimensional, so basically the set of zero modes for given operator, then it's called Fredhorn. Then for compact manifolds, uh, why we like elliptic operators? Because actually, so there is a theorem that on M, which is compact, if D is elliptic, then it's Fredholm, then D is Fredholm. So of course this is not true for non-compact. For non-compact life becomes more complicated and we will discuss it later on. So, but what is wonderful is the following. If you give me operator, I do the simple check of the index, uh, sorry, of the symbol, I would actually know that uh, the kernels are finite dimensional. So in a way when I will write for you, um, just as example, so if you would write for you the action, Right, so for example, for, uh, for the scalar field on M dimensional manifold, right? So this is just this action. So this is a phi is a scalar field. So what is very, very important, why we do like, why we would like that he stands an elliptic operator because this guy we can actually invert. So here what we are having in the case of scalar, right? So this would be exactly, I mean, if I write more abstractly, this is phi Laplace phi. And because the kernel is finite dimensional, I can control it very clearly. So I can actually know exactly how many zero modes. So it makes sense to talk about this. So for example, if I would replace just, if I go to some other manifolds, etc., and my operator, I don't know, not elliptic, I don't know, parabolic or whatever, then, I mean, I will not have any possibility to define in any meaningful way the things. That's basically the reasons. And supersymmetry is perfect in this sense. So I will tell you a lot of stuff. I will, com I mean, I will comment about supersymmetry towards the end. So I, I hope you heard a lot enough, enough about supersymmetry last week, so I will not repeat it. But supersymmetry is basically wonderful in a sense that it picks up, uh, you know, elliptic problems. Because always, uh, you know, for bosonic fields, your operators are always elliptic. 
up to gauge fixing, etc. So for the gauge fields, you have to take extra care of. And then for fermionic fields, you have Dirac operators. So if you look at your actions and, for example, look up to you know, quadratic order, all your operators will be always elliptic. And supersymmetry is automatically taking care of this. So if I would, for example, try to do it more abstractly, I have to think about it. Okay? So this is about elliptic operators. So let me see what else I want to tell you. That, uh, that, that, Lapla that is the, uh, is the Tehran Laplacian. But one uh, can have also the tensor Laplacian with the covariant derivative. One does not work with forms. You can do many things. Yeah, but the, the question is, uh, is that elliptic too? Uh, your question is not well posed. Let me explain why. No, 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 no. no. The thing is, what is important here, uh, so you write operator, you have to decide on which object it acts, etc. So first of all, um, covariant derivative, you don't care about covariance because uh, covariant derivative, the connection, it's low order in derivative, so you can throw it away. So it ha has no effect on ellipticity. So ellipticity, this is what is amazing about the things, and this is, I mean, f this theorem is not that trivial, but the thing is that I don't care what stuff you add there. Uh, and what I was warning you why your problem have to well pause, because for example, when you have covariant derivatives, you will also have kinetic terms for A's, and then you have to think a bit harder. So I will tell you more about this later on. But in principle, always, um, you know, I mean, your covariant derivative, for example, if I add the A, D uh, minus, let's, do, let's be physicists and write A, although I hate it. Uh, it drives me crazy to put the size, <laughs> but just for your difference, this is difference between mathematicians and physicists. That's what Nikita was mentioning yesterday. Uh, well, physicists put ice everywhere, although it's nonsense. Uh, so, for example, what I'm telling you from point of differential operators, these guys, or if you start to calculate Laplacian from this, uh, this is low order guy. So you can throw it away. It has no effect on ellipticity. Uh, but gauge fields are by itself important. So now let me give you a bunch of the problems to solve that you actually get a hint what ellipticity is. Uh, and this is very important. Right. Um, so exercises this comments so typically if you write the actions uh, for example for bosonic guys then um, your operators uh, what appears in the action it's second order elliptic so for example in gauge theory so when you write the in gauge theory this thing so again, I will now do non-abelian -abel gauge things because I'm interested only up to quadratic order. So whenever I linearize my problem, I don't care about being non-abelian. So this is formally this. If I write more abstractly. This is not elliptic operator, of course, and you know very well because this guy has a too much uh, degree. I mean, too, you know, it has a gauge symmetry. So actually, of course, when you do gauge fixing and you introduce ghosts, etc., so the terms which you actually consider in these ones, right? You have a d dagger a star d dagger a. So this is gauge fixing. This is standard Lorentz gauge. So now if you write this abstractly, this is exactly this. So again, here what I'm doing is uh, just when I'm discussing forms, omega, so I mean, my scalar product defined in this way. So when you discuss ellipticity, actually you have to see what uh, for the gauge field you invert in there. So you have to look at the gauge uh, term plus gauge fixing. And of course you add, I mean, when you do actual calculation, you, go, you add ghosts, etc., to compensate certain things. But when I'm actually looking at elliptic operator for gauge field, it's Laplacian on one forms. Okay. 
Uh, so in actions, for, as far as bosons concerns, even fields are concerns, you always have a second order uh, elliptic operators when you do the gauge fixing. Uh, now there are a number of uh, very important elliptic problems which is first order. And that's exactly what I would like you to... I'm looking for a reason. What I would like for you, that you do this exercise. So please prove the following things. So exercise number one. So in 2D, F equals zero, D dagger of A, it's elliptic problem. So by the way, first check when you do elliptic problems, just check the conditions you do. Because for example, um, right here, uh, you have connection A. So when you will write a symbol, so the exercise you do the following, you write this again, everything linearized order, I don't care about being non-abelian, you write this, you write this, and then you replace derivative by xi. So you will get two by two matrix on A1, A2 equal to zero. And the important thing that this matrix, when I write xi, should be invertible. So for example, this object, you obviously write xi1, xi2, right? And then, uh, well, this you can figure out yourself. Okay, I'm basically going to write it for you. Xi1 minus xi2. So now you calculate the determinant of this guy. Uh, I did it. Right, sorry, yeah. Otherwise, I would not get what I want. Right, so this is, uh, right, so the first term, what I'm doing, I'm doing the following thing. I have D2 A1 minus 1, 2, and then I have D1 A1 plus D2 A2, and then I'm just writing this, guys. And then determinant of this thing is uh, Xi2 square plus Xi1 square. And this is positive away from zero. So it's elliptic. I solved it for you. But now I will give you something more complicated, two problems, which I'm going to use ellipticity. Uh, this would be important for discussion of so 5D theory. So exercise two. So in 3D, so I'm in 3D, so I have a gauge field and I would have a adjoint scalar. So transform an adjoint. So please prove that this problem is elliptic. Exercise three. So now I'm in 4D. So I just have a gauge field. So I will have a metric. So I defined F plus, which is equal to one plus star F equal to zero. I can put one half and D dagger of A equal to zero. So this is instant on equation. So this is again elliptic. Well, finally, since you know Nikita was talking about this yesterday, so if I have a Riemann surface to the manifold, let me say this is complex manifold, complex. So then uh, this problem is also elliptic. So all problems we are dealing in, this is basically our ideal world that you would like to everything reduce to elliptic problems. So please do it. I mean, this is a relatively simple exercise. In a way, maybe it's better to start from this. Uh, this is just dimensional reduction of this problem, actually.
Okay, so let me tell you something more about operators and then uh, I will go through some examples what I'm doing there. Um, there is another notion uh, which is apparently in old days we were ignoring. So in old days, basically till, uh, I don't know, uh, till end of 90s, etc. I mean, I mean, the whole pattern was that everything should be elliptic. So either you do second order problems, they're elliptic, they're typically hard. But for example, you know, you cannot calculate exactly whatever Young Mills, you are trying to do something simpler. So for example, you go to this problem, it's elliptic. I mean, wonderful thing that ellipticity basically guarantees you that the modular space of this problem finite dimensional, and then you can do quite a lot, etc. What we actually learn one of the uh, main at least mathematical conceptual thing of what Vasily did is the following that Actually, supersymmetry likes not only elliptic operators, they like what's called transversely elliptic operators. Um, so again, the catch is that for elliptic operator, the kernel is finite dimensional, so we can calculate, we can write determinants of operators, we can do quite a lot and model spaces. Uh, but um, basically, there is other situation. So let me try to give you an idea. Um, so for example, I have this operator uh, D on S2, which is dal just Dalbo operator. And this is nice elliptic operator. So what I can try to do, uh, so I will give you definition, formal definition in a moment, but first I will not try to uh, tell you the idea. So what I can do, so this is a nice elliptic operator. So I can lift my problem to something three-dimensional. So I can do S1 times S2. So here I would have coordinate zeta, zeta bar. And then here I would have coordinate T. Okay. So then if you ask me to write a formally whatever Laplace operator here, well, this is not a rocket science. You will write something like minus operator t square plus d d bar. So I, I'm writing this minus because this is a then positive definite operator because you know if I expand in Fourier modes I will have i n so then it will be positive. So now uh, if you stare at this example there is a following things happens is that a priori uh, if I now right so formally my operator d is defined on the whole space. So I can take, for example, now my form. So I still, so I can, in this very simple example, I can discuss, uh, so I have my uh, vector field T. I have one form DT. So for example, I can talk about horizontal forms. So the forms which is, has a legs only along S2. And I can have PQ decomposition. Okay. And of course, I will have for your operator, which I can define DH. So it's operator, for example, which map a horizontal, I don't know, zero, zero form to horizontal one, zero form. So it will do the standard thing, but the only thing is that this forms and this form depends on T, right? So this operator is not elliptic in any way. I mean, there is no possibility to have a finite dimensional kernel simply because this operator acts only on zeta coordinates and t dependence is not controlled. But the funny thing is the following. In this particular problem, this is a very elementary problem. What I can do, I can basically take uh, and expand everything in Fourier modes. So instead of looking at this problem, I can basically reduce this problem to the following thing. So I look at my Fourier modes. So I would basically would say that L of T uh, on whatever my form is equal to I N of, I can put label N here, right? And then I can do it with the zero forms H. So now I can put label N. So it's a Fourier mode expansion. And if I add by D, I will get to H one zero N. Again, very trivial statement. So it acts on Fourier modes. But now this is elliptic guy. Now from point of view for representations, what I'm doing is that this is basically, I'm taking my omega and 
I'm decomposing. So I have my omega h p q, and I'm decomposing in the representations with respect to u1. So I'm just expanding in Fourier modes. Uh, at every component, D is elliptic operator. So this is basically the notion of transverse ellipticity. Trans, trans, elliptic operator. So this is the idea. This is very important. And that's what supersymmetry is also teaching us, that this operators is important. So of course, this is a very trivial case. Uh, before I give you a formal definition, let me just give you a much less trivial case. So for example, if I have S3, <coughs> so S3 is just this example. If I'm writing as part of, you know, in C2, right, this is my S3. So again, if you read Nakahara last night, you should know that this is famous hop vibration. So you can take S3 over S2 over S1. So now in this example, in this trivial example, uh, it was uh, you know, trivial. So he is very easy to expand in Fourier modes. In fact, I will also do this exercise later on, expanding in Fourier modes here. But the thing is, what is important, there is U1 action. So in principle, I can, like here, I can introduce my vector field for this U1 action. So again, hop fibers. And um, then I can have a kappa, which is connection, with a property that IV kappa is equal to 1, IV D kappa is equal to 0. So then I can decompose my forms. I can decompose my forms uh, to vertical and horizontal. So this is done by the following things: is uh, this is kappa of h i v. This is vertical thing. This is one minus kappa of h i v. So this is a standard thing which people use in uh, for principal bundles, etc. OK, um, so what I can do further on, uh, on horizontal guys, I can easily introduce, uh, because it's effectively like forms on S2, I can introduce PQ decomposition. So there are basically a horizontal complex structure. I can define for you the complex structure there. And then I can define for you operator DH. So. <coughs> And this is again exactly the example of transverse elliptic elliptic operator. Now the story of Fourier expansion in this example, etc., it's a bit more complicated. So we will talk <coughs> about it. So uh, let me give you a definition of. Uh, transverse elliptic operator, and then you will see how you actually check transversality. Um, so basically what I have to do, uh, so I will define my uh, cotangent bundle of the manifold. So I have an action of the group on my manifold. So I mean, in this example, it's U1. So I will define the elements such a way that uh, this is elements, so this is uh, whatever my x size in T star of m, such that x i contracted with vector field is zero. So v, so v, v is associated, associated to the action of g. So of course, 
if my g is not u1, I have more vector fields. I will satisfy everything. So I'm looking at one forms, which is transverse, uh, which are contracted with fundamental vector fields. <coughs> so then I check transversality elliptic. So it should actually, I have to check ellipticity on all these directions. So if I have operator D and I'm looking sigma, so in this setup, what I have to do, I have to put here, guys, so alpha, so I put a alpha x, xi alpha. But I have to check this invertibility only on xi, which is in Tg of m. <coughs> and again, this is point-like statement. This is linear algebra only. Because uh, what is important in general, uh, these vector fields can vanish. So, I mean, this is not a regular thing in any way. And in fact, most of the cases, for example, for two-dimensional manifolds, etc. I mean, so this is a free action. This is an example of free action, but there is a lot of uh, actions are not free. Uh, so, you know, it's important that these conditions check point-wise. So when your xi belongs here, and then xi, of course, is not zero, so not all component zero, then you have to check that this is basically guy invertible. So this is called transverse ellipticity. So supersymmetry actually is telling us that they appear all the time. Now the question is, why do they appear all the time? Uh, so there is, in fact, a very simple criteria there. And this is already boils down to this formula. Uh, so let me tell you abstractly, and then I will go to examples in field theory. Uh, how do they appear in supersymmetry? Uh, the effect is the following, basically. So imagine I have my operator. So I will write, uh, write what we have, d, d dagger, for example. Right? Something like this. So typically, imagine I have u1 action. So this is typically will be some lead derivative of v square minus 1. So typically, there is a conspiracy between uh, this being elliptic operator and this being transversely elliptic. So if this is a second order elliptic operator, Then this is part exactly corresponding to the derivative. Then whatever is remaining, this guy typically will be transversely elliptic. So in old days, when you think about instantons, the instantons is the following. It's basically about trying to take in smart way square root of Laplacian. And then taking square root of Laplacian, you get actually this problem. So you get instantons. Now, if you have a U1 actions, you can do things in a bit uh, different way. And that's exactly where supersymmetry leads us. So you actually can take your second order and you, in a way, try to take a square root only in directions which is transverse to the group action. And this type of problem is finite dimensional. Now, again, the kernels of these guys are infinite dimensional. But the problem is that the kernels, so the kernel of D, typically its dimensions will be infinite dimensional. But kernel of D has a, basically it's decomposed in a representation. So it's a sum of a reps of, uh, of whatever group you have. Typically it's combination of your ones, of some spaces. And this is all spaces is finite dimensional. So this is very powerful concept. So now instead of actually counting, so before the key thing was dimensionality of the kernel, it was number. Uh, so as uh, you know, there is a smart word is called categorification. So number is not good. So if it's number, it should be value of a function at some point, etc. So 
I mean, in a way, in this approach, it's much better because this would be a function typically here. So this would be certain whatever character stains because I have to keep track of representations. But you see, the problem is not now bad. So I actually can uh, deal with the things and exactly this way. So, I mean, transversely ellipt elliptic, it means that kernel can be decomposed in irreducible finite dimensional representations of this. Uh, so just maybe let me give you a very trivial example, but very instructive, which we are going to use. Uh, now, also this statement is very good even for elliptic operators, but then when space is non-compact. Because when space is non-compact, ellipticity and being Fred Holm is not the same. So sometimes I have to use it. So let me give you this example. We are going to use. So imagine I have C, and I ask you to deal with this operator D bar, right? And for example, I would like to ask you, can you calculate me? So this is type of situations we like. Again, formally, it's elliptic operator in this setup, but I mean, it's already important. So I ask you to calculate for me a kernel of D prime. So typically, if I would be on compact manifold, this would be a very small space. I mean, for functions, it will be typically only constant, etc. Because my kernel is equal, what is this? Well, you can know how to do it. So I would have one, zeta, zeta square, etc. So I will have basically all holomorphic functions. And if it's regular, then they have expansion, etc. So in a way, if you look at dimensionality, it's infinite dimension is not very, very useful. But at the same time, what I can encode my information, I have a U1 rotation of plane. And I wrote all this guy, they're exactly in irreducible representations under rotation. So instead of this, I can encode my index in the following way. I would write my index of D bar operator is equal to and then I basically will write a character for every representation one plus t plus t square plus etc. So this would be basically k from zero to infinity tk, and that would be one over t. So this is index of Dirac operator. So you see uh, now you understand this is basically as a sum of characters. So I keep track of the things. So I carry this information. Again, I cannot do it if I wouldn't have a U1. Okay. So I think this is all this formal stuff. I will go through examples. Any questions? It's a good time to ask questions now. So everything is crystal clear. Uh, compact manifold, if the operator is a flip form, is it uh, automatically elliptic? I think so. I don't remember these details of math, but I think so. Typically, you like to, I mean, ellipticity, it's very easy to check. You give me operator, I mean, within 30 seconds, I check ellipticity. Well, Fred Holm is hard to prove. Any other questions? Okay, so I will go through some, so my plan is the following. I will just give you now, um, so remember, I had this formula, which is unfortunately erased. So I will maybe put it here. And I will go for you for three examples now. Uh, this would be two and three dimensional examples, just pinpoint for your operators. And uh, it's not a gauge theories yet. So then later on, I will switch to gauge theories. So for gauge theories, I will introduce certain things. And um, how much time do I have? I'm lost. Hmm? More than half an hour. Okay. Um, right. So. Let me just, I'm, I'm sorry I'm erased, but I would like to write for you this. Because now I will give you a different, uh, 
and so then I had sorry for copying this I be fast Here's appropriate kernel of operator. Okay. So I wanted to show you which situations actually I mean we have in physics, etc. And I'm considering examples without gauge fields, just simply life is simpler. So when I will switch to gauge theories, I have to lie to you because I actually don't wanna I don't have time to explain to you why all fields are there, etc. So this is explained in this paper by Tia Jefferis about ghost etc about wild model so this part i want to skip so for now i don't want to complicate life so let me start with the following problem so it's a field theory so i'm looking first at two-dimensional field theory so again i'm using very similar notations so imagine i have a map from s2 to cn so again this is very similar what nikita was discussing yesterday I can map it to complex manifold, but let me do it simple. Uh, so then my space would be is this. <coughs> so now what I will do, I have a complex coordinates here. So what I will do, so this is x uh, bar i equal to h zeta i bar so in this example uh, first of all you can see that uh, r0 and r1 are put it to zero which we can do so it will square just and then if you want i can of course modify them by putting appropriate conditions so here I will put pl uh, minus d bar x i and then here I will put basically plus i d bar psi i so it does not modify the algebra <laughs> instead of writing them in burst exact terms okay uh, so first of all these fields my fields here so this is fields which is take value in 0, 1 form on my S2 with the values in T. Well, I mean, a pullback of T, 1, 0 of, M of C. If you want to be pedantic. So it's exactly the structure. So my space, my manifold now. So my manifold, which I hold the manifold, it's maps on uh, from S2 to Cn then when you introduce Psi it's actually uh, so with Psi this becomes an odd tangent bundle and this is just a bundle so these guys happen to be a vector bundle over maps again it takes a time to get used to this language but anyhow I mean the fact that geometrically everything works it's exactly this So the thing here, why do we need, in this particular example, we allow to have R0 and R1 to be equal to 0? It's simply because the operator del is elliptic. So del, del bar, sorry, del is elliptic. So in principle, if you will write your uh, delta of W, this would be the following, it will be delta of x zeta bar i g i j bar h zeta j bar minus d x j bar so this model i mean in fact just to to let you know what exactly i'm writing this is another rewriting of chiral field in two dimension 
there is a, you can actually take a physical chiral field on S2 and rewrite in this form. Okay. So if you write this explicitly, what I will get, I will get D X I G I J bar D bar, uh, sorry, D bar D X J bar plus chi zeta I G I Okay, so in this case, what we're actually getting, so if we calculate determinants, so first of all, this would sit on holomorphic maps. So the maps which map, I mean, preserve complex structure to complex structure here. So the fixed points are fixed points is just d bar of x i equal to zero. So now if I'm looking at determinants, now did my determinants are I mean, I assume that they are around an uh, isolated point. So my determinants are uh, basically one half dd dagger, determinant of one half dd dagger. So if my holomorphic map would be actually isolated, so I would just get one. Um, so typically it's not isolated. I mean, the thing is that because this guy is non-compact, there are too many of them, etc. But in principle, I mean, this is example where, I mean, determinants is very, very easy. So this uh, type of calculations people were doing, you know, this is what Witten introduced end of 80s and then keep going, etc. So this is a model. So this is, leads to Gromov Witten invariance. Witten. Again, the complication is that uh, actually you have to understand this one because there is a model of space, etc. But as far as determinants, it's just this. Sometimes it may be one, maybe minus one if we start to discuss subtlety relating to square roots, etc. So this is first model. So you see uh, here why I could put these guys to zero because it was important to me that this is would be transversely, uh, sorry, this is elliptic operator second order. And then I could actually uh, take a square root and I just get again elliptic problem. So it looks nice. So, I mean, in a way the things are cancel out. So the next level you can do, you can do the following thing. So next example to D. So my S2, again, on Cn, but my S2 has a U1 symmetry. There's two fixed points. So I will have a vector field V for this. So then my transformations actually can be written as follows. then I will have again here the same object as before. So again, I can write here minus del bar x i. And then here delta h of zeta, sorry, bar, bar i goes to lead derivative of v of chi zeta bar i minus or plus del uh, oops, I, I. Okay. So here my D is del operator. Then uh, my I zero is L V on zero forms, and R one is L V on either one zero form so or zero one forms. So now the fact is that uh, so remember that what was important to me, it was important this property, otherwise algebra doesn't work. 
This is obvious because Li derivative commutes with Dalbo. It commutes with Diram, it commutes with Dalbo. It's just a uh, you know, result of um, Carton calculus. So this is guaranteed. So this is example what people sometimes called, you know, some version of equivalent version of uh, of Gromovitan. Again, for example, if you would put actually a supersymmetric theory with a chiral field on the sphere, that's algebra you will get. So you can map it. And this is a rotation so on this. So this is more close to supersymmetry because it squares not to zero. So this algebra will actually. So if you calculate this algebra, it squares to Lie derivative on all fields. So of course, if you start to write here in this example, delta uh, delta w, then this is you can write two terms, psi mu, g mu nu, li derivative of v of x nu, <coughs> plus I mean the same term I wrote before chi zeta bar i, g i j bar, x zeta j bar minus d x j bar. So if I look at the bosonic operator, then what I actually will get, it's a LV square plus d d bar. It's still OK operator. So by the way, um, if you would have a symmetry, so otherwise it wouldn't make sense. I mean, you could also replace this by C, by plane. So you can actually deal with this operator. It's OK, it has uh, infinite dimensional kernels, but you basically can parameterize the kernels of this part using representations of this. That's what you actually gain by introducing this equivalence. But you can also do it on S2. Okay, So that's what you get. And again, we can deal with this. And for example, now the problem becomes very meaningful because formally what you will get, you will get basically the following thing. So if you start to look at determinants, again, I'm not discussing if it's my localization locus isolated, not isolated. I mean, you have to do certain subtleties. Uh, now let's look what I will get here. So now if I start this symmetry, I actually will get here by localization is the following. So upstairs I get fermions, so whatever from here to here. So I have to calculate my operator LV on these objects on uh, one zero forms uh, with the values in uh, T01 of my manifold. I can take a square root because I have two copies. If I'm ignoring phase, that's what I will get. Okay, this is just comes from these fields. Downstairs, I will get a determinant of zero, zero forms of LV. And that's it's a question if it's one, not one, etc. So this type of determinants will become non-one. I will discuss how to calculate these determinants. I mean, for this case, I will not do it. I will tell you exactly explicitly for S3 and for S5. Okay. But this is concrete determinant. So what I have to do actually, I have to take S2 and then I have well-defined you know, forms here. I have this guy, I have zero forms here, I have these guys. There will be presumably a big constellations, but that's what I have to do. So then we have just to calculate. which we don't have enough tools for the moment. So that was a problem number two. So problem number three. Let's erase this thing. And that's where we relaxed even more things. So you see, first I started to having things purely elliptic and then Problem number three, 
3D. So I will have a map from S3 to C. Well, C and let's say. So in fact, Carroll field can be lifted from two dimensions to three. It's the same field content. So again, uh, I have a rotation now. U1 acts on S3. So in principle, on S3, I have two T2 action, but for example, I can think of this for simplicity as just a, a hop vibration. So it's the vector field corresponds to hop fiber. Okay. And then I can write for you uh, introduce. So I can, as before I told you, I can introduce vector field. I can introduce uh, one form and I can decompose all my forms to vertical and horizontal with respect to hop fiber. And then, moreover, horizontal will admit PQ decomposition. So there will be almost complex structure on this subspace. In fact, it's integrable. So it's what mathematically called Sasaki manifold. OK? Then what I will have here, my fields will be the following. D is equal to Psi mu. Delta Psi mu is equal to LV x mu. So here, as I told before, I can introduce this operator, which is horizontal. Now delta uh, chi of zeta bar i equal to Okay, and then uh, here we'll have delta <coughs> LV of chi bar i my plus dh bar psi. Okay, so now what is important that my field chi zeta uh, bar i and the same field h zeta bar i, they in horizontal uh, zero one form in the values again to be pedantic I have to write a pullback one zero okay now if I write for you a burst exact term so I have to So I feel that everybody got decoupled and bored to death. But you know, life is not easy. It will just get worse. I mean, this is a baby game. I mean, gauge theory is harder. Okay, uh, so now I write this term. Now if I, again, write uh, my exact term, so what I will get, I will get the following. So quadratic term, I will get minus lv square plus dh dh bar so in in this story so if i identify this operator so i0 r1 this is just the derivative and then my d operator is this dh bar etc so now this is almost transversely elliptic operator So now if I want to calculate determinants, so downstairs, this is zero form, zero form. So I will get a determinant on zero forms, one half of a LV. So I'm writing this. I mean, again, actually it descends not only zero forms, it descends further down. It descends to, um, to the basically kernel of del operator. And up there, I will have a, this is a horizontal one zero forms LV. So here I have to write a, a square root, by the way, sorry, I forgot to write downstairs square root. Here I can get rid of square root because formally I will have one zero plus zero one. And 
up to the face I can take a square root. Um, here I cannot take a square root, so I made a mistake, let me correct it. Look different yesterday. Okay. And again, uh, so this is actually uh, I, I get omegas. They descend to uh, Dalbu. I mean kernels of Dalbu operators, and then I have to analyze there what's going on. Now the kernels of Dalbu in this problem is infinite dimensional, but still I can do it. So because they are transversely elliptic operators. So you see this is different stories you can have and different uh, things. So all these operators in principle possible and the sort of biggest possibility is when this is transverse elliptic, this is just some operator corresponding to your one action, but I always have to require that this is second order of elliptic operator. Any questions? Because I feel either you know everything or you just Questions? So how is this uh, horizontal operator defined? The del H? I mean, we start from the splitting into horizontal forms? Right. And then you have to introduce so. So for example, in S3, uh, so you introduce vector field, introduce one form. How you do it, you read Nakahara, and this is one of the basic exercises. This is connection one form for hop vibration. So then you introduce these guys, omega V plus omega horizontal. Then the thing is that horizontal subspace, it's two-dimensional subspace. So there is exist almost complex structure. Most complex structure exists. Well, I mean, it's just some map which squares to zero you can define. So further on, these guys you can define as a PQ forms. Is it clear or not? I mean, here we enter the land that uh, either you know a lot of differential geometry or will be you lost because index theorems, nothing I can, I mean, help you about. That's, I'm not, wasn't joking about this. I mean, you have to know Nakahara quite well. I mean, this is not, I mean, this is general fact for any contact manifold. I mean, there is this decomposition and horizontal forms can be decomposed further on. Then what I have to do, so the definitions of my operator is basically, so D uh, has horizontal leg, and then I can basically decompose this as usual, doing like this. For general contact manifold, this does not square to zero, but for this guy, I mean, I don't know how to explain better for you, but this guy in case of hop vibration actually will square to DH2. Zero. So is it just composition with projection to the horizontal part? It's a composition with horizontal part and then you use almost complex structure. The thing is that this property is not guaranteed. So this is, uh, this manifolds for which it works, I mean, I can write for you the name. Sasakian manifolds. Sasakian. I mean, this non-trivial property, before it's algebra, you take the RAM, you decompose, and then you have almost complex structure, decompose, etc. Any other questions? I'm, I'm pretty honest. If you lost already, then it would not get better. Uh, so please ask questions. I actually have no idea what you know, what you don't know, etc. I was told to tell you about uh, index theorems. So that's what I'm about to do.
Okay, you lost. Good. And at least it's not my problem. I gave you a chance to. Um, what do you have to study from these examples? I just don't understand. You read, you read a few examples, and we didn't calculate anything. You know, what do you have to understand? What you have to you have to understand that there are different possibilities. I mean, what you have to understand. I mean. Yeah, but you ask me questions. I'm asking you, do you understand what I told you or you just don't? Because the thing is that you don't have questions, it seems maybe you don't follow. I'm just telling you, giving you examples. I'm saying is you can have elliptic, you can have, uh, you know, elliptic operator plus U1 action, and then you can have U1 action transverse elliptic operator. All these examples are well defined and calculable. So in old days, you will do only first example. I mean, now with supersymmetry, we can do more examples. So I'm confronting with these things. The main thing is why I'm doing this slowly, because at some point I will write you 10 fields, many, many bundles, and I will write you for, I mean, a lot of determinants. And what I'm saying is that underlying principle, it's always very simple. So it's always will basically fulfill the structure. So the only thing I may have more lines, etc., but it's always has a structure. I always will get this as answer. It's always will be super determinant of some operator. So I move in some complications because one of the problem is that when I write a gauge theory, I will have 10, I mean, not 10, but three times more fields. So that's why I'm going through these examples. Okay. And for many folks, there is a boundary to have some gender or without. So you understand everything without boundary already? Mm, roughly. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, there is versions of, uh, yeah, uh, of different theorems with the boundary. With the boundary, it's much more complicated to do the things. Because with the boundary, for example, to guarantee that your elliptic problem is well defined, I mean, you have to put a certain boundary condition, etc. It's a complication. It's uh, people study this problem, they, they didn't care about this uh, rigorous medical foundation and uh, how do we know them make it correct answer? What, what's the question? Some physics criteria, um, I don't know if one has to go through this uh, rigorous uh, um, mathematics. If you want to calculate something, understand, you have to go through the rigorous stuff. Otherwise, you know, I mean, I don't know how to answer. Okay, um, but again, um, if you have more questions, it's time to ask. Maybe, maybe just comment on the previous question that uh, it shouldn't be confused between the boundaries uh, on M, which is basically the field space that we're going to do, and the boundaries in uh, space-time. Correct, yeah. Yeah, by the way, all these operators I'm considering, they're from, you know, uh, from well, world sheet. I mean, that's, I'm not discussing anything. I'm looking at field series. I'm not discussing the CN, etc. So everything on S2, S3 in these examples where. Okay. Good. No questions. Okay. Let's decouple even more. Uh, so what I need is uh, now to discuss with you. So my plan is the following. Uh, so I would like to give you some basic facts about index theorems and also particular two examples, CP1 and CP2. And then next uh, two lectures, I would like to give you idea how to calculate determinants for S3 and then how to calculate determinants for S5 and introducing for you uh, gauge theories. Again, my warning is that I will have many more fields and more complicated determinants. But now it's a tool, so it's a, um, just mathematical, um, you know, deviation from, uh, but I need it basically. The whole idea is the following, that I have to know for operators how to Okay, let me see what I wanted to say. And again, uh, about index theorems, let me just make a warning. It's a big subject. And transverse elliptic operators, it's a very subtle subject. 
So majority of physicists don't know and it's hard to read uh, ITA thing. So I will try to do for you just examples to give you hints of this. Okay. So what's the idea of Induct Theorem? So I have my operator D, elliptic. Tick operator. And um, one of the problem is the following. So every operator, so elliptic I told you, so, so far we are on compact space, compact space M. So uh, as I told you, D is Fred Hall. Fred Hall. So then uh, I can define, this is what's called index. So I can take uh, index of D, this is a dimensionality of kernel of D minus dimensionality of kernel of D. Okay, and this is a number. So this is because of ellipticity, it's a number. It's you just have to calculate. So if in principle you wanna calculate the thing uh, analytically, so this is thing is called analytical index, uh, then it's pretty complicated. Uh, but in 60s, what was realized is that this number actually controlled by topology. So on compact manifolds, I can write for you the formula which would tell me that this object is controlled by topology. So I can write basically some generalized gauss banner theorem. Okay. And uh, for this, we are using uh, different characteristic classes. So let me write for you example at here, bot theorem. So this is just example. Um, again, I'm basically, since because of my applications, I will use for you the uh, Dalbo operator. Okay. And also quite often I need a Dalbo operator, which is twisted by uh, a vector bundle. It means that yeah, I need a covariant version. So I have a vector bundle, I have a connection. So actually, I mean, by this, it means that I have a covariant version of this guy plus connection term. So analytically, for example, this is written for one operator. So quite often what we need, we need, uh, uh, and this is what we have quite often, we have uh, so this is elliptic operator. There is a notion of elliptic complex. So when uh, we go, so uh, example of elliptic complex, keep in mind it's for example, a DRAM. So the complex calls elliptic, if I will calculate the symbols of these operators and they exact. So if I compose this symbol with this, I mean, this would be exact sequence. Okay. So quite often the number you would like to calculate here. So the index of this thing of del bar of E will be basically just uh, minus one K whatever dimensionality of these cohomologies for this operator. I mean, cohomologies and kernels are naturally related. Again, it's a number. If I try to solve it analytically, it's very complicated. So it will give me some finite number. So there is a prescription, which is at your board. So let me write for your formula and just to give you an idea, minus 2 pi i n So instead of solving PDEs, I can write this integral of certain objects. So this is different characteristic classes. So this is a, for example, um, 
I start to feel stupid. Who, uh, raise the hands. Who knows characteristic classes? Okay. Who knows? Uh, okay, lower the hands. I, I will be done. Who knows equivalent characteristic classes? Okay. Uh, so I, I saw so I have zero minutes, uh, but I, I started later. <laughs> now let me just tell you things. So um, actually Google it in the theorem. So I will give you tomorrow equivalent version of this and we will calculate examples and I will tell you how to calculate determinants. But I will give you example wise. Anyhow, um, so since most of you knows what's characteristic class, this is Todd class of this bundle. This is churn character. It's certain classes. So typically characteristic classes are produced by putting curvatures in, um, uh, in invariant polynomials, etc. So this integral, when you actually want to calculate, it depends on, uh, you know, on connection. But eventually the result is independent of connection. So this is purely topological thing. So I have to finish now, but uh, let me just give you an idea. So again, look at this as a black box. If you don't understand, there is some recipe. This is hard to calculate from first principles. You do some, you know, some magic and you, you have to integrate this. It's basically generalization of gauss bonnet theorem. Uh, now, typically in old days, people would calculate by doing some complicated things with um, characteristic classes, etc., for concrete geometries. Now, what we actually can do, if the manifold admits U1 action, then we can actually upgrade this formula and we can introduce characteristic classes and we can use Atiyabot formula. So eventually on Atiyabot formula, I can write this as a sum of a contribution from fixed points. And then the calculation becomes a very, very nice and simple. So to calculate the index, I just need to know certain data discreetly at fixed points. And this I can do both for usual elliptic operators and transverse elliptic operators. So I will finish here and so tomorrow I will uh, continue this index theorem and then right away I will give you application of index theorem for, uh, for determinants in S3 and S5 case. Yeah, thank you.